covenant blessing is not an option. It's a mandate. Covenant blessing. I'm going to show you today where God has mandated your blessings. And I have you know God's not a man that he could lie. God has promised blessings to you. Whether you receive them or not is an option that you have. But it is God's mandate. He doesn't give the option. It's a mandate. But the option is up to us. I'll talk to you about that in a second. Now, debt is a problem, and I'll tell you why. Here's five reasons that debt is a problem. It promotes discontentment, number one. When you acquire things too easily or without the pride of ownership, you become dissatisfied quickly. Look at the people that win lottos and those kind of things. The high percentage, 80%, whatever it is, 78, 82, 83% of those people either get divorced, commit suicide, end up in jail, or broke within two years. I mean, you know, money, when it comes, comes with responsibility. And when you take money and you get it on the cheap, I mean, if you know, that money is going to charge you. Number two, debt's a problem, and here's number two. It makes arrogant presumptions about the future. Now, that's important to hear that. Luke chapter 12, verse 16 through 21, if you read verse 18, it says, so he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will restore all my crops and my goods, verse 19. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take it ease, eat, drink, uh, 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 drink up, for many years, take it ease, take your ease, eat and drink and be merry. I mean, you hear that. Verse 20, but God said to him, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will, the, the, whose will those things be which you have provided? We need to be very, very careful because debt will make you live a presumptuous life. Number three, it requires you to transfer your future wealth to your creditors. That's a powerful statement. Debt makes you transfer your future's wealth to your creditors. So instead of you having money that you're building on interest for your own account, you've given it to debtors to pay your 20% on a credit card. And you're going to pay thousands of dollars to them instead of having thousands of dollars. My daughter went to Hawaii. Someone... Uh, gave her a gift to go to Hawaii, take a break. And uh, so she did. She's a teacher in the schools and stuff. And a long-term girlfriend of hers, whose parents live in Hawaii, said, come on over and we'll pay for your airfare. She was thrilled. And so I heard about it, and of course, and I gave her a little check. So I gave her a check so she'd have spending money. How many of you know, that's a good position to be in. Because so when you die, you know, and you, all of it's done and everybody's cried where they got no more tears, here's what comes usually, anger. Because the creditors, they're not crying with that loss. Hi, Miss Jones. Uh, we're just calling about this bill you owe. We understand your parent died and now that bill's in your custody. Come on, saints. Number four, it limits your options. God can't lead you. When you're in debt, you're driven by your debt. I have to work because I have to pay a bill. I have to work two jobs because I got to pay bills. Or I have to do such and such. I can't go today. I can't serve here. I can't help there because I've got to work because I got debt. Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seemeth right to man, but the end thereof is destruction. Right. How do you know debt makes you a prisoner? Yes. It makes you so you don't get to go do that thing. I was talking to a guy the other day. You know what he said to me? He said, I decided not to have Thanksgiving with my mom and dad. Well, that bothered me at first. He says, well, here's what I decided to do. I sent them on a 21-day cruise. And I went, wow, that's so cool. He said, I paid everything and let my mom and dad go on a cruise for 21 days. 
How many you know that's the way it ought to be? That's when you're a blessing instead of the other way. How many say, I'm going to be a blessing? Number five. How many you know these five, five points here could change your life? Number five, debt is a problem. It steals your freedom and it makes you a slave. Proverbs 22, 7, a person who borrows is a servant to the lender. Come on. We need a supernatural war plan for debt release. How many of you want to get rid of debt? How many of you want to get rid of debt? How many agree with what I just shared with you that debt does at least those five things and more sometimes? All right. Number one, here's the key. And then I'll give you number two and three. If you just listen, what happens is this supernatural war plan, you got to start with your announcement from your release of debt cavity, captivity, and you just did it a minute ago. Right. How do you know out of your mouth is your own deliverance? Yeah. You can bind yourself or deliver yourself with your own words. Yes. The Bible says you're snared by the words of your mouth. Right. When you're a negative person, you always speak about negative things. You get what you speak about. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Number two. Then you have to deal in the spiritual realm and bind the spirit that's behind the debt. Hello? How do you know behind the, the anointing is the spirit of God? Yes. Good preacher, good singer, good whatever. There's an anointing. The spirit of God's behind that voice. And how many of you know behind uh, ISIS and all these murdering crazies out there, this guy that went in the... Uh, abortion clinic the other day and shot uh, three people. How do you know there's an insanity spirit? I mean, you look at the guy's face, you can tell he lost something. But I don't look at him, I look what's behind him. It's always the key to know is what's behind the person. Remember, praise paralyzes the devil. Can you do that? Put your hands up and paralyze him right now. Come on, just paralyze the devil right now. Tell him he has no effect in your life. He has no authority in your life. He has no control in your life. He does not have permission to come into your life. Paralyzing the enemy from tricking and deceiving you. If I had the time, I would spend a whole day on talking about a spirit of deception that's in the world today. There's a spirit, a demonic figure of deception that's moving through the earth and it's deceiving people, and it'll even deceive the very elect, it says, in the last days. There's a spirit of deception on the land to make people think one thing when they ought to be thinking another thing. Now, number three, and I'm moving through these because I've already preached it. Apply violent faith. You're going to have a war plan. You've got to have the right thinking and announcements. You've got to bind the devil, get a good plan there, paralyze the devil by praise, and you've got to apply violent faith. Matthew 11, 12. Violent faith is intense and consistently exerted. Violent faith doesn't take a break. It is constant until it has its manifestation. The violent shall take it by force. Violent faith. My faith is violent faith. How do you know it's a consistent thing? You got to wake up in the morning and put on your boots. Then put on your shoes. But put on your boots in the first place. Get yourself right with God. It's a battle every day contending for the faith. That's what, that's what Jude said. You got to contend for the faith. Get in the ring. Put your hands up. Get a hold of your enemy. And don't give up till you knock him out. Here's the last one. Learn how to press in on the promise of debt cancellation. Philippians says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but the one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind uh, like debt that I had uh, and reaching forward uh, to those things which is debt cancellation, which is ahead. I press to the goal of the prize of the upward call uh, that's in Christ Jesus. I declare. I declare. Come on, say it like you mean it. I declare. I'm getting, out of debt. I'm getting out of debt this year, this year. 2016. 2016. Amen. Amen. Now, 
Let me move you right into the second piece here. In this great walk of faith, we've been talking about faith, it has become very obvious to me when I look at this thing that we have the final determination as to whether or not we're going to be blessed. Looking at faith, you and I, the final determination of whether or not we're going to be blessed is really up to you and me. I have come to believe that the difference between blessed people and people who seem to live without blessing is faith. The Bible says Jesus is coming back on the earth and when he does, he's looking for faith. Whatsoever is not a faith is sin. Faith is the thing that pleases him. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. How many know faith is what pleases God? It's impossible to please God without faith. Abraham believed, and God tells us that this was counted to him as righteousness. Now, I don't have the time, but I got to tell you something, saints. Your belief in what you have faith for will move you to a righteous lifestyle. You won't be a thief anymore. You won't be stealing from God. You won't be living half in and half out. See, your faith in God uh, is putting God uh, still on the cross. But your belief is that he came down uh, and now he's living inside of you. And now because he's living inside of you, you're accountable to the way you act and live. The blessing of God is inevitable in your life and, and in my life if we believe. If you're a note taker, write it down. If we believe. Now, let's go back and look at the book of Genesis or the genesis of our faith and the faith movement. Let's look at it for a minute. Genesis 15, turn there. One through six. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram. He hasn't had his name changed yet. In a vision saying, fear not, Abram. I am your shield, your abundant compensation, and your reward shall be exceedingly great. How many of you know that sounds good? And Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me since I am going on from this world childless and he shall be the owner and heir of my house in the steward Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram continued and looked, you have given me no child and a servant born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man shall not be your heir, but he shall come from your own body and shall be your heir. And he brought him outside this tent, his tent into the starlight. And he said, look now toward the heavens and count the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And verse six, and he, Abram, uh, believed uh, in and trusted in uh, and relied on and remained steadfast to the Lord. Come on, he hears God. God starts giving him a promise and it says Abraham believed. And he counted it to him, God counted it to him as righteousness or right standing with God. Now, you gotta get this. God comes to the servant Abram and made covenant with him here. And he covenanted with Abram to give him a son. He said he would bless Abram and his family and make them into a nation that would bless all the nations of the earth. Bless. How many of you know we're all the nations of the earth? Verse 17. When the sun had gone down and a thick darkness had come on, behold, a smoking oven and a flaming torch passed between these two pieces. And on the same day, the Lord made a covenant and promised pledge with Abram, saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates, the land of, and it lists who it was, who the land belonged to. God said, I've given it to you. Now watch this. Something so different begins to happen. The covenant act of what I read to you there is that he split the animals in half. And he laid two halves down. But listen to this. This sacrifice was not uncommon to their culture. This was not the first time they had ever done this. That's not where the miracle is. How many of you know the burning bush was not the first time a bush caught on fire? Out in those deserts, bushes caught on fire all the time. But there's only one bush 
that talked. So you have to understand that when God cut the animal, he put them there, two halves. He set one side, one side here. But look here, there's two entities that show up. Now, the smoking furnace was God, the Father, and the flaming torch was Jesus, the Son of God. But here's the key. God didn't make covenant with Abram. God made covenant with himself. God the Father and God the Son decided to walk between that sacrifice and that day covenant was made between God and God, two is the witness, and God said because of that, it can never be broken. Now watch this. Israel can never give up that land. Every time Israel has tried to give up that land, it has destroyed them. That land was part of this covenant. Remember what he said to Abram? I'm going to give you the land. God said, how do I know I'm going to inherit it? And God brought a miracle in their midst. How many of you know that God had to make this covenant between himself and his son so that the covenant would never be broken? Now watch this. That means Israel cannot give that land away. That means that Israel will be on that land when Jesus comes back. Okay, that's the land. But what about the blessing to every nation? Have you know the blessing was in the package with the land? I'm going to give you the land, and I'm going to make you a blessing to every nation. The blessing of God was ordered by God in the Son and could never be retracted. So you and I come along, and this one named Jesus who was in the covenant, he becomes a curse for you and I so that by his blood, uh, you and I are redeemed by the blood uh, and because of his blood, uh, that covenant was brought back to man uh, so that every blessing that Abraham had uh, was now ours. Go to Galatians chapter three and look at verse 13 and 14. The apostle Paul says something very amazing. He says that Jesus became a curse for us that we might inherit the blessings of Abraham because the covenant cannot be voided. It has to be acted on. And Jesus made the covenant active again through the shed blood. Now look at this, saints. I'm gonna try to sew it all together. How many you know what Abraham saw in the dream was he saw Israel rebelling against God. And he saw Israel breaking the covenant. So what does God do? He drives them out of Egypt, restores them back onto the land, the promised land. Hello? Amen. Now God blesses them again. Israel backslides, leaves God. Now what's happening right now, if you read Ezekiel and you read other places in the Bible, the Jewish people, the Israelites, are coming home from all over the world. They have a mandate to go home. They're coming home from Germany, Russia. They're coming home from America. They're coming home from all, even in China. There's Jews. They found a whole uh, section of Jews that live in China. They're coming home. Why? Because God's word all the way back in Abraham was that he would bless them and give them that land. And so Israel's going to go home, saints. Are you listening to me? Yeah. And God is going to bless Israel. I don't care Ayatollah anybody. I don't care Iran. I don't care if Iran gets the biggest bomb that's ever getting made. Iran cannot destroy what God has set in motion. Because God is a promise-keeping God. He's so committed to his word that he sends Jesus, who was in the covenant, to become the covenant 
so that you and I can now get the blessings of Abraham. Look, they killed six million Jews and the Jews are still here. Hitler said, I'm gonna eliminate them all. I'm gonna get rid of all the Jews. And God said, you're a fool. You can't do it, boy. God is a covenant-keeping God. And when God sent Jesus, the covenant had been broken, and now the covenant is reinstated by the blood of the Lamb. So when you and I come to the altar and surrender to Jesus, the blessings of Jehovah are now enacted into our lives, and you and I, that's why, saints, some that have faith, everybody has faith, but some that have faith, they believe the word. And because they believe the word, they count it unto them as righteousness. Righteousness is right deeds. It's why, saints, many people in the church today walk around and all they do is complain. All they do is they, they fight and argue and they go through all kinds of twisted things because they're living as a subpar individual and they're gonna wander for 40 years until they die off and then somebody else in their family will rise up and God will give the blessing to your children or to your children's children because you wouldn't take the blessing. This covenant can't be voided. I'm going to say it again. This covenant can't be voided. It has to be acted on. Now, both Israel and the church have violated the blessing covenant many times. But Jesus, when I fail, has become the curse. And that releases the blessing of Abraham back in my life. We have been grafted into the covenant God made with Abraham. He's the father of faith. We got grafted in. Do you know you have no choice if you believe God and practice what you believe but to be blessed? We all have a measure of faith, but do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe what your faith says? Do you believe what faith says? opens up for you. See, faith opens things up. Believing is why you walk through it. Faith says that's Jesus walking on the water. Believing says I can walk on it too. Are you listening to me? We need to understand this principle today. If you do, you will change your life forever. The promise of God for Israel is that Israel will have that land called Israel. Mark it down. They've been trying to get them off that land since 1948. They've been trying to get them off ever since. Everybody's tried. Hitler tried. Everybody's tried. Everybody's attempted. Every time Sharon or some of them guys get up and start trading land, the dealings of God comes to Israel. Every time they start trying to deal with that land, God starts to deal with them because that land is in God's promise to Abraham. And if God promised something to Abraham, he won't let a rebellious Jew mess up that promise. How many you know God wants to bless the city? This church has done more to bless the city. Let me, let me take you somewhere for just a couple of minutes and I'm going to pray with you. Do you know when I first came, God gave me a vision that this church could, could grow and that we would, would, would bless our city. So we have done nothing since those years. And we started with less than 15 people or maybe about 15 people. We just started a handful. We grew, we grew, we grew. We had some great times of growth. We had some great times of blessing. The anointing is coming here. But we've stayed true to what God told us to do. He told us to feed the hungry. He told us to take care of the wicked uh, that, that would fall and, and, and need help, the, the sinner. And so we've done that. He told us to love them. He told us to be a hospital, to take care of those kind of people. And we've done that. And he's told us to reach the nations. We have nations of the world come to this church. He's told us to do these things because it is our DNA purpose. The only reason, look, saints, give me another church that you know of that it can open its door and give away a yellow ticket for free and have 125,000 people show up. And you're the actors. 
That ought to tell you everything. I mean, you ought to stand in front of the mirror and say, they're coming to, you know, I know who I am. I want all the professional actors to raise your hand. That's what I thought. God takes a simple thing to confound the wise. The new commissioner, out of nowhere, God makes him come here, have us lay hands on him, have the archbishop from Africa lay hands. We all laid hands. We prophesied to him, and he becomes the new intern uh, set in. Uh, come on. Before, look, look, look. God brings them in this house. I have a meeting coming up that I'm going to meet with the person who's going to become the next mayor. I ain't telling you who it is. In time, I will. I'll do it before the election so you'll know that God spoke to me. Why? Because God's word is true. And then, and then Charles Green gets up and says, you know, they're going to send the politicians to you. Know, and I'm going, oh, Jesus, don't let him tell, me, tell them who it is. <laughs> because this church has faith. Amen. But there's some in this church that believe yes. their faith. Amen. Stand to your feet today. Give God some praise.